Hello and welcome to another of my unboxings and reviews of one of my watches. In this case it's a Omega Speedmaster first Omega in space. So let's get this big impressive box open and see what's inside. And it's a big old box, bit of foam there, a bit of packing. We've got the manual there and this pops down and we see this nice impressive black matte black wooden box it's a big old thing so let's move him out of the way put this down here and a little catch there which we have to press to open it up a bit awkward and here we have the watch itself as you can see it's quite an impressive box uh, we've got a nice grey kind of velour interior first time we're in space Log at the back there, October the 3rd, 1962. And if we just go down here a little bit, we've got this little plaque which commemorates the events of the time. This particular model is based upon a watch that was a personal watch of the astronaut um, Willie Shearer. And that's his name there. He was a Mercury pilot back in the early 60s and went up into space, as it says there, October the 3rd, 1962. The watch is, as it says here, a numbered edition, not a limited edition. Omega are a bit sneaky like that. Um, so I've no idea how many they're going to make. I suspect as many as they're able to sell. Um, mine is something like in the 4,000s, so I guess there's at least 4,000 odd been made so far. And so we can look at this watch here. Um, it's a very nice watch. It's a Speedmaster, but not a Speedmaster professional. It's a sort of pre-moon watch, uh, and consequently it's not a professional. It's similar to a uh, professional, but there are some very subtle differences which appeal to me. And now looking at the back, the case back, we've got this nice, um, unusual case back. It's got the usual Omega symbol there, the Hippocampus, I believe it's called some kind of seahorse monster type thing. Um, it's also got engraved there, it says the first Omega in space, and below there it's October the 3rd, uh, 1962 again. It's on a calf leather strap, very comfortable, quite padded, uh, nice little retro buckle there. The case itself is slightly smaller than a standard Speedmaster Professional at 39.7mm I think. Whereas the professional is about 42. Um, though I have been told that the difference is money down to the fact that this watch mimics the originals from the 50s and early 60s in having no crown guards, which were added later at the behest of NASA, I believe. And that sort of takes away a, a mill or two from the overall dimensions. Now here's a wrist shot. Uh, my wrists are seven and a quarter inches in diameter. This is a almost a, a 40 mil watch which is about right for me particularly on a strap it's very comfortable it doesn't feel too big and it's not particularly slim i mean it's one of those things that i have a thing about being left-handed and wearing the watch on my left hand i like to have a slim watch i would imagine it would, might have been a bit thinner given it's a manual watch it doesn't have a rotor in there as an automatic would as you can see it's got a very nice crystal on there with an interesting edge to it, interesting design, and it's sapphire. It's not Hesalite, as is the one on the current Speedmaster Professionals. And that may be a, what, a kind of faux pas in terms of trying to copy the original from the late 50s and 60s, but in terms of practical use, in terms of day-to-day -day durability, I mean, I'm quite happy to go for a, a, a sapphire crystal. It's much, much harder, much, much, um, better wearing and not as easily scratched so that's fine by me. Now the movement in here is the same as the Speedmaster Professional, it's the 1861 um, which has been used for donkey's years ever since I guess the late 60s, early 70s. I'm not an Omega guru, uh, I'm not a massive fanboy, um, I just know it's a nice reliable movement. What did surprise me was it's actually quite a slow movement, it ticks very slowly, it's almost like a um, an old tractor or something, an old diesel tractor, it just running along very slowly. I guess it'll last a hell of a long time. I think it runs at 21,000. 
Uh, I'm quite used to 28s, a standard of course, a must watch these days, and the 36,000 VPH on my Zenith El Primeros. So this sounds incredibly slow, <laughs> um, but it works well, it keeps good time. I haven't timed it recently, when I got it I was dead keen and, and timed it, I think it was 3 seconds uh, slow. Maybe it's picked up a little bit since then. What I don't want to do in this review is go into the um, long history of the watch. Um, it's historical connotations, it's um, technical um, elements. I mean, there are some fantastic reviews on YouTube already. There's one, a great one on Watch You Want Inc. There's another good one on the TGV channel. And they are far better than I could manage uh, with my little camera here. But what I will want to do is to just discuss the buying process, the discounts available, and the sort of pricing, whether it's a good price or bad price, what other people think and so on. Because at the end of the day, that's what's important to a lot of buyers. I've had this watch now about a year. Um, I bought it almost accidentally, as sometimes happens with me. I'd gone to the AD for Rolex to look at the 39mm um, Oyster Perpetual, which were quite new at the time. Uh, they seemed quite nice, quite cheap, for Rolex anyway. And I was quite keen on buying one, uh, but there was just something about it I wasn't quite happy with. The indexes weren't quite there for me, and in the end I decided not to go ahead and buy one. I then wandered over to the Omega Boutique next door, had a look round. Uh, I have tried on the Omega Professional Speedmaster a few times in the past and obviously you see them all over the internet. Um, and I just couldn't get over the bracelet, it did, I just didn't like it, I didn't like the style of it, I thought it felt a bit cheap um, compared to what I was used to on a Rolex. And so I'd always sort of bypassed it, but I popped in and just had a look round when I saw this and I thought, oh, I remember seeing um, some reviews of it on the internet. And so I knew a little bit about it already, um, tried it on, liked it, um, and decided that this could be a Manix watch in place of the 39mm Rolex Oyster Perpetual. Um, I do like my chronographs, I mean, I think almost all of my watches are chronographs apart from one or two. Um, so I thought, yeah, maybe this is a itch I've got to scratch. Everyone should have a Speedmaster Professional if you're into watches, allegedly. and. I don't like following the crowd, so there was no way I was going to buy a standard professional Speedmaster just because everybody else has got one if I didn't really like it. Um, we then sat down, two cups of tea, a biscuit, and I tried to get a decent discount on, on this watch. Retail is £3,400, um, UK pounds, and I knew I could see it for sort of 2728 at the time from the likes of Iconic, the Grey Dealers. And so I wanted somewhere close to that. I wasn't going to get it, but certainly I wanted maybe 3,000. Um, the difference between 3 and 3.8 to me, it wasn't worth buying a grey market model, having to wait, having concerns about where it came from, perhaps having the instruction booklets in Greek or, it or Italian or whatever. Um, so I tried to get him down to 3 and... He only offered me £100 off as some sort of um, token gesture, which I wasn't very happy about. But in the end, um, we came to a agreement whereby I got a voucher from the boutique, who are part of a bigger um, dealership, um, for the money that I wanted off. I think it was £400, um, which I soon spent uh, on a gift for somebody else, which I was going to buy anyway. So we sort of both had a win-win. I would have got it anyway. Um, and obviously it didn't cost them £400 to give me that voucher because they're making a profit on whatever it was we, we ended up buying. So in the end, you know, it wasn't too bad. Um, it's a bit odd getting used to having to manually wind a watch every day or every two days. It's not something I'm used to, but I actually quite like it. It's a little novel event at the end of the day. You wind it up and you know it's going to be okay again for another 48 hours. Now the big question is, is this value for money? Not that any Swiss watch really is. Um, compared to a Speedmaster Professional, which I think is about £100 less than this, and you get um, a big box and little bells and whistles to go with it, but for the watch itself, 
normally a watch with a strap rather than a bracelet is much cheaper to buy new I mean usually what five hundred pounds at least and even sometimes more and and yet with this particular watch I'm paying hundred pounds more for the pleasure of having a strap rather than a bracelet which doesn't seem particularly good value um, that said you are paying for something a bit different it's not the run of the mill professional speedmaster um, and I think you have to pay for anything that's a little bit different it's a bit uh, special I know Omega <laughs> seem to be very famous for putting out um, limited editions um, I know the latest Snoopy has gone completely mental and people are buying them for twice the retail price but that's quite unusual I think whether this will ever be worth um, a lot more than I paid for it I very much doubt I have no idea how many they'll make I mean mine's just over 4,000 I suspect they'll make them until they can't sell them anymore until the next special edition comes out Although, being in manufacturing in the past, I would suspect they made a fixed amount some time ago, maybe 2012 when this model was launched, and they've got them sitting in a warehouse in Omega, which will trickle out as the years go by until they're all gone. And when it comes to the loom, um, I'm a bit of a loom freak, I like a nice strong loom. It's average at best. Um, I can forgive it because the batons, the markers are very slim, very elegant, although I do believe they're slightly longer than on a, a Speedmaster Professional um, so they're, they're, I mean they're okay but nothing to shout about really in terms of using the chronograph yeah it's it's a nice um, chronograph the feel of the buttons for starting and stopping isn't quite as good as on a, something like an El Primero or a Daytona but then again those watches are much more expensive than this um, you've got to give it a fair old push to get it to start and stop it does feel a little bit rough at times although having said that it works fine um, it zeroes back instantly it's gone back to zero perfectly fine um, I know there are some people who go on about um, the seconds hand stuttering slightly when it first starts or whatever but honestly I never noticed that and even if I did it wouldn't really concern me so in conclusion then um, the watch is a good, solid, fairly simple watch actually. Uh, whether it's good value for money or not, I would like to say it's a bit unusual in that it's uh, more expensive than a Speedmaster Professional which has a bracelet, not a strap. Um, so that sort of leads you into a little idea that maybe it is slightly overpriced but then you pay that for something a bit different and that's fine by me as long as it's not too much. Um, it's not very waterproof, I've not checked but I suspect it's about 50 metres which basically means don't swim in it, um, it's shower proof rather than being waterproof so that's a point to remember um, what else can we say about it? it runs fine, obviously I suspect it will continue to run fine for many years given it's got that slow beat movement in it, 21,000 um, VPH is a pretty slow and it should last a long long time and in conclusion then it's a pretty simple chronograph uh, it's got a great history should be reliable for many years and if it ever needs servicing or when it needs servicing or whatever it's it can be serviced by pretty much any uh, watchmaker I wouldn't consider owning a more um, complicated coaxial movement from Omega I would think that in the years to come um, they'll be difficult to service, expensive to service and Omega are pushing right now to make sure you have to go back to the factory to have them serviced whereas with this watch, with its nice simple Lamania based um, 1861 movement I think pretty much any decent watchmaker could have a go at fixing it and servicing it without any too many issues as long as they can get the spare parts of course and at the end of the day um, we buy these things because we like them uh, we like the look of them I would never buy a watch that everybody else raved about even if it's a fantastic price and it had a fantastic movement if I didn't like the way it looked um, and I do like this one it's not perfect of course the loom could, could be improved the waterproofing isn't that good um, but overall it's a good solid watch and I'm happy to own it and that brings us to the end of this very short um, review, ownership review of my Omega, first Omega in space. Cheers.